The History with Jackson podcast. Hello and welcome back to History with Jackson. I'm your host, Jackson, and if it is your first time listening to the podcast, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Now, before I jump into today's episode, I'd like to ask you to consider subscribing or supporting me to do what I do here at History of Jackson through the History of Jackson Plus membership on Apple Podcasts or through my Buy Me A Coffee profile that will be in the description below this episode. Without further ado, I'd like to talk to you about today's episode. So today I am speaking to Pamela Roberts all about her brand new book, The Adventures of a Black Edwardian Intellectual, the story of James Arthur Harley. James Arthur Harley had an amazingly fascinating life and I know you're going to enjoy listening to Pamela talk all about the various events and happenings within this exciting man's life. So I will leave you in the fantastic hands of Pamela. Right, so hello and welcome back to the History with Jackson podcast. Today we are talking to author and historian Pamela Roberts about her book, The Adventures of a Black Edwardian Intellectual, the story of James Arthur Harley. How are you doing, Pamela? I'm great, Jackson. Thank you so much for inviting me to the podcast. No worries at all. Thank you very much for coming on. I'm really excited to talk about your book. So this is a question that I like to ask all the guests on the History of Jackson podcast. And I, I want to ask you, what inspired you to write this book? My inspiration was the discovery of Harley's archive in a battered suitcase in a family home in Shepshed in Leicester. I've never heard of Shepshed. And through my research, I was able to track down this archive. And upon discovering it, I paid a visit to, I was invited by the homeowner, a wonderful old gentleman, who invited me to see the suitcase. And upon opening it, I saw fragments of this man's life. In one sense, I was really happy. And in the second sense, I was really sad to see what he has achieved. But there was no recognition. There was no knowledge of him. But it was so fascinating, so tantalizing, these different bits of paper just decaying. And that was the inspiration to A, to research and know more about him. So that started my quest as a detective, like five years piecing his life together. And just to tell his story. I, th- I think it's really interesting that you, you came across this man, uh, you know, just, just through uh, some finding something in someone's attic i think that's that's a really interesting piece of information there and it just comes to show you know how history can be anywhere and how we can find it and and explore these stories a little bit more so this book is about james arthur harley and i feel that we can't really have a conversation about him without really finding out you know who was james arthur harley and i'd also like to to find out what his early life was like okay so james arthur harley is uh, a man born in Antigua. Um, if you have any Antiguan listeners from the village of All Saints, born the 15th of May, 1873, um, to a white father, Henry James Harley, and a black seamstress mother, Josephine Eleanor Lake. Now, with regards to his father, it's unclear, and from the research that I've carried out, it doesn't seem to be that his father was a presence in his life, but there's reference to his father being a sugar owner. So that translates today as plantation owner. So whether the father was an owner of the plantation or an overseer, it's not clear. So he grew up in a very rural little village, country boy doing chores for his mother, playing with the village children and went to the village school it's it's certainly very interesting background for for harley there and you know he he wanted more from antigua and eventually he he leaves antigua and moves to puerto rico and then and moves to the us what made him want to to make this journey um so at the time you're look, looking at 40 years after emancipation but you also had 
the sugar plantation owners deserted Antigua in droves, so it became an island of absentee landlords. However, the black population didn't have any opportunities afforded to them. What Harley wanted as a child was his vocation was to become a minister in a Protestant Episcopalian church. That was his vocation. So pursuing a career on the island, whether it be a minister, a doctor, a lawyer, was very, very limited. I mentioned Harley was mixed race, but even as a mixed race young man, opportunities were still limited. The best he could attest to was a clerk or senior clerk on the island. So Harley trained as a teacher and he taught in government schools and he was a qualified headmaster. And again, because of the limited opportunities on the island, he actually went to Puerto Rico for teaching work. And as while he was in Puerto Rico, he came across the Reverend Bean, who gave him references for the General Theology Seminary. It's such a fascinating life and such a fascinating journey off to, to Puerto Rico and the US. And, and it shows how, how difficult that situation was in Antigua, that people were being forced to move away from the island and move elsewhere for, for opportunities and pursue their dreams. What I found interesting is in, in 1899, Harley joined and went to Howard University in Washington, D.C. And whilst he was in D.C., he's introduced the black elites of the city. I, I want to I, I want to kind of touch on, you know, his relationship with the, these people. How did they impact his life? Uh, well, the first impact was he met his future wife, who was a daughter of um, Jesse and Rosetta Lawson. And Jesse and Rosetta Lawson were what I would describe as powerhouse social activists. The father was um, the financial director for the Afro-American Council, which was a forerunner to the NAACP, so the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, Josephine's mother, his wife, his later wife, she was um, chairwoman of the National Colored Women's Association and Women's Education Projects. So these two were really dynamic as part of this Washington black elite scene. So apart from being introduced to the daughter and marrying her later, it was, and even for me, when I was researching and writing the book, I had never come across reference to elite. And I'm talking about the elite in the sense of their money, their prestige and status. So a lot of the old Washington black elite came from, as I said, old money, status, in terms of their lineage, and there are certain guidelines and the rules about who could be part of that group. So you had this very exclusive enclave in Washington at that time, and they were referred to as the Negro aristocracy, you know, the blue blood of Washington. So here Harley interacted and navigated with these people and had introductions to various social events and parties, etc. But also the networks for him to get on. So that was just fascinating, researching Josephine's family and his whole Washington black elite. It was it was really interesting reading about uh, that scene and that and that group of people and how he was able to to interact and navigate that space. Uh, mm. particularly as someone who has just entered that scene as well. And I did find it quite interesting how he, he met his wife through or future wife through that. But he was also on a, on a mission uh, to become educated uh, and, to, and to reach his goals. And in 1902, Harley enrolled at Yale, although that, that, that stint at Yale didn't last very long at all. And instead, he moved to, to Harvard. So why did he move to Harvard? And, and leave Yale and what was his life like at Harvard? Okay so why he enrolled in in Yale because at first he did apply to Harvard and he was turned down. So Harley, Harley is a person I describe as a polymath. He is a man at that time so we're talking 1900s in America so you're talking with horrific racial prejudice where the look 
from a black man to a white man could literally result in his death. So this is not me being hyperbolic. This is the reality of the situation. And what I find that I loved about Harley was he was forthright, he was educated, he had that background, that education to literally look at anyone and know he was as good as them. So his dream was to pursue this academic dream and go to Harvard. Unfortunately, he couldn't afford Harvard that first time he applied. So instead, he applied to go to Yale and he'd accepted on the scholarship. Now, it's really interesting. You think, oh, Harvard, but Yale is second best to him. He sees Yale as a second poor substitute. And he's there long enough. And he's a very gifted oratory. And he's there long enough before he makes another application to Harvard. And this time he's successful and is awarded a scholarship. So at Harvard, and again, you read in the book, you read the background of Harvard University and them taking and accepting black students, which I found was really interesting. But at Harvard, he kind of acquainted himself, not with the other African-American students, but very much seeing himself as different. And his one friend at Harvard was another black scholar called Alan Leroy Locke. And his name may be familiar to some of your listeners. So he went on to become the first black Rhodes Scholar. So the letters and the interactions between Locke and Harley at Harvard. Would you agree with me to say some of them are really illuminating? You do kind of gasp and go, oh, right. I didn't know they were thinking that. <laughs> Yeah, I, d- I did really enjoy reading the uh, the interactions and the letters between those two because it, it, it certainly showed a a close friendship and, and, and similar opinions between the two men, uh, mm. which I found quite funny. Yeah, yeah. I, but how they set themselves apart in terms of, and again, it's interesting how the interplay of classism comes in as well yes. as racism, but how class... And again, how they set themselves apart from the other black students at Harvard. Oh, yeah, I found I found the the conversations around class to be you know very very interesting. In that um, you know, if you mentioned you know, it's it's a lot of it comes from the difference between uh, British uh, British views and American views. Mm. Um, and you know, could you could you touch on that a little bit more for us, please? Um, so so again. What I found was interesting through my research, when Harley arrives in America, he arrives as a Caribbean from Antigua, as I said, uh, and a mixed-race Caribbean man. And people from the Caribbean had this innate sense of a knowledge of being better then. And it was this kind of almost arrogancy where people, because of that British education, you know, they were educated by king and country. All the books, the textbooks were English. So they had this innate ability to think, I am superior to you. So you had this interesting kind of paradox of when you had West Indians in America, African Americans, from an outside view, you look at it and think, oh, they're all black people, let it all get on. No. There was this layer of African American blacks. West Indian blacks. The West Indian blacks looked at the African Americans at a lower level in terms of what they were putting up with and what they were taking. The African Americans then viewed the West Indians as terms of superiority and very much for who do you think you are. So, and then Harley had the extra layer of being mixed race. So, navigating this, as you can see, him navigating this again, set against this backdrop of horrific racial prejudice. It's fascinating. Oh, yeah, you know, I found it fascinating reading your book and seeing those dynamics play out, not only between Harley and, and Leroy Locke, but, but also between Harley and the other scholars within his courses and his, uh, his classes. And it made for some really interesting dynamics. On, on the next step of uh, Harley's educational journey, I mean, he was ferocious in, in wanting to meet his, his goals and 
and achieve his dream. And he he left. He finished Harvard and he left to go or he applied to, to go to Oxford afterwards. And he ended up going to Oxford, which is a remarkable achievement to to have attended two of the best universities in the world within such a short amount of time. But how did he adapt to England and, and academic life at Oxford? It, this is again interested to look at it from Harley's point of view. So by now, Harley's in his mid-30s. He's at Oxford. But what I found interesting, he came to study for a degree in theology at Jesus College. He also studied for a diploma in anthropology. And he was the first black student on that diploma course. So the diploma course took five years to set up by the university. And there were three students. There was Harley as the first black man, um, Barbara Freire Macchio as the first woman, and Francis, oh my God, forgive me, I forgot his name, but he was a middle class baron. So it was interested to have these three different people. So let me set the scene. Harley has arrived from America. At Howard, he qualified as a lawyer. He won prizes as a gifted orator. Spent a year at Yale. He then goes to Harvard. He has a degree in Semitic languages. He's studying for a degree now in theology at Jesus College. And he enters Pitt Rivers Museum for the first degree, sorry, the first diploma in anthropology. Now, this is 1907, early Edwardian Britain. And at the time, the theories were around black people being subhuman, intellectually inferior, less than. So enter stage right, Harley with his list of qualifications. And on the course, he is studying about subhuman man. The theories are about blacks and different races, their skins, the smallness of their brains. So it just goes against everything he is reading the course curriculum. So I just found that, wow, in terms of the resilience to read about your less than, you know, your, your studying. And again, the course was based on primitive humans against savage humory. So it just kind of, this dichotomy of what he was and what he was studying. So his time at Oxford, Apart from his studies and the work that he had to do, I would say I get the impression it was enjoyable because he was there with Locke, his friend, and as well as the studying, he also took part in debating societies. He also visited different churches and he was preaching. So there's a sense of he knew what he had to do to get to the next level. There also seems to be a, a determination there uh, to kind of prove that those theories wrong and, and to push himself to, to be just as good, if not better, than the other people around him. And, you know, having all these degrees and diplomas, uh, he then begins his journey to become a minister, which I this separate journey, this, this journey to become a minister, I found so fascinating. Uh, you know, it's an amazing story. And, and a part of that, Part of that for me is that he had a lot of help from the Bishop of Peterborough uh, on this journey. And I, I'm from Peterborough, but it's always great to see uh, Peterborough in a book. So with the help of the, uh, the Bishop of Peterborough, he becomes a deacon. How mm. does Harley's journey within the church unfold from here? Oh, my gosh. So it takes another turn. So Harley is made a deacon, and he's sent to his first curacy in Shepshed, this is a link now, Shepshed Leicester at St. Bothell's Church. And the incumbent vicar is a Reverend William Hetworth, who's been there for over 30 years. So Hardy comes in, this educated black man, in 1909, in this very small, rural little village. And as someone said, can you imagine Sunday morning, the parishioners walk into church and is Oh, right. But Harley had not only the gift of the gal as an orator, he had the teachings, he had that background. And the local parishioners 
absolutely loved him. They engaged with him. They thought he was amazing. And this is really forward thinking. So this is 1909. And Harley sets up a men's group, a Bible group, a Shakespeare group for men. And I'm thinking, we talk about mental health now and health and well-being. He was doing this in 1909. This is uncharacteristic. Because as a parishioner, you come to church on Sunday, you listen to what the priest tells you, you read your Bible, you go home, and you come back the following week. And that goes on. Harley was about invigorating people and making them live and to do things. And that comes across. That brings him into conflict with the incumbent vicar. And there's this jealousy of, I've been here 30 years. It's a novelty. It will wear off. It doesn't wear off. The people keep coming and they like him. He's, he sounds like he has such a connection with the people that, that meet him. Mm. The people that meet him seem to absolutely adore him. And I think it's it's such a it's such an interesting story and that journey towards becoming a deacon and being and his journey within the church mm. really highlights those skills that he developed whilst at those several universities. I, w- I want to pick up someone that we met earlier in the episode. No, I, I want to kind of touch on her a little bit more. And in 1910, Josephine Lawson, Harley's wife, joins him in England after eight years, eight long years of exchanging letters, which I must say, it must have been incredibly difficult for them, you know, without text or phone calls or FaceTime or anything. Eight years of exchanging letters must have been difficult. But how does their life together develop, grow and blossom from this point in 1910? Okay, so they're married in, in, in yeah, England in Oxford at the registry office. And at first, Josephine's in Oxford. And when I write for my research, my assumption is she's come from Washington, D.C. So picture the scene. Her father is having regular meetings with William McKinley, the president at the time, talking about the race issue. Her mother is a powerhouse, dynamic woman. The mother travels to Scotland to lecture. She goes to Europe. And one of the writings I found about the mother is she said, when I return, I'm going to stop in London and Paris and buy silk gowns. So Josephine has this lifestyle, this education. She qualifies as a teacher from Albany College, and she was teaching before she came. So she's come from this really busy cosmopolitan life, and she's social, and she's mixing. She comes to Oxford for the first couple of months. And it's not as cosmopolitan as Washington, but it's busy. Harley gets his second curacy in Marshside, which is eight miles from Canterbury. Now, doing no research, I went there in 2015. And if you're familiar with the movie Brigadoon, where the village appears once every hundred years, and it looks like time stood still, this is what Marshside reminded me of. It's so quiet there's one shop two churches and a pub it really is that quiet and it's 2015 and I went my mum and it's that kind of you get out of the car and people looking at you and you're like oh okay this is different and we met the local vicar who took us around and the first thing I thought when I saw Marside no disrespect to Marside but I'm thinking You've come from this hustle, bustle, community, your teacher, you've got friends, you've got family and network, and it's like you're transported to a place where no one looks like you, no one sounds like you, it's very different, it's quiet, nothing's happening, there's no support network, there's nothing, and you're regarded as just a woman. So not an educated woman, it's just a woman. <laughs> and in terms of Harley's wife, so you're just there to cook and clean. You're not educating young minds, you're not crafting, you're not talking to your father about politics or when he visited. The... You're there on your own. And I have to admit, I did a week for Josephine because it was just the isolation must be so intolerable 
in terms of those first couple of months. And they lived in a little cottage. And from where they lived to where the village shop was, was a good sturdy 20 minutes walk. So Harley was busy developing is a rural parish. So he had to travel a lot. And it'd be either on foot or bicycle. So Josephine was always by herself in the cottage. And again, there was a little village school. But as a woman, I don't know what would be more offensive, as I said in the book. Her being a woman, her being African-American, you know, being able to teach, that would be unheard of. So I just feel Josephine's pain and the realisation of what she's come to in terms of this marriage and what her role is, and this new role as a curate's wife, and has been very, very isolated in Mars' side. It must have been, like you said, it must have been a massive cultural shock. You know, Washington, Washington DC is a huge, <laughs> huge city. Um, and to go to rural, uh, rural England, where attitudes, culture, even the food is vastly different from anything in, in DC. Um, you know, said so, like you said, you really feel for Josephine on that and that cultural change. Mm, mm. But one year later, Harley and and Josephine have this new event that happens and Harley finally becomes a priest. He is he has reached that achieved that goal that he had when he was in Antigua. But where does the church take him from here personally and professionally? Because he's achieved his goal. So he achieved his goal. He's a priest and he's, you know, ordaining, christening, he's doing kind of priestly duties. And then the political landscape changes and it's the outbreak of First World War. And I see Harley as a man of wanting to do something, wanting to contribute. And very much, I here as a priest cannot ask others to put themselves on the line or sacrifice their, their lives. I have to do something. But again, as a priest, you can't fight. And he's a much older man now. So what he does is literally like a Renaissance man. He trains as a skilled munitions worker. And he comes to London and he undertakes courses at King's College and also in the Strand. And then returns, he returns to Shepshed where they requisition the old lace factory into the munitions factory and becomes a munitions worker. It's a, it's a big change. You know, you've worked all that, all that time to, to go and become a priest and you achieve your goal and then suddenly you change because of those political situations. Where does this go after the war? Does he, does he stay uh, working as a munitions worker or does he return back to the fold of the church? He stays, I think he's still involved with the church. From the research I've done, he's still involved with the church. But then there's this, this period where he just seems to be a recluse and he disappears. And when I pick up the threads of his life again, he's now a local Labour politician, but he stands as an independent candidate. So this is 1926 in Leicester, in Shepshed. He stands at the local council, and again he's campaigning on. It's quite interesting in terms of parallels today. He's campaigning about the cost of living, campaigning about rates and taxes, and he's saying, "What are we paying all our money for? What is the council doing?" And he's elected. And he's seen very much as a firebrand councillor. So in council meetings, he would actually call, I don't want the papers presented to me at the meeting. Send them to me beforehand. And basically accuse everyone on the council of being in the clique and having this hush-hush policy. And everyone's kind of like having contracts. Because on the council, it's literally... You know, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. And Harley's sitting there as a sole voice. And I, oh, stop it. Oh, my gosh, what are you doing? And he's calling out his fellow councillors and saying, well, you're all corrupt. I think you should resign. 
he must have been such a formidable opponent uh, within those council chambers. I certainly wouldn't have wanted to go against him <laughs> in those chambers. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and again, one of the things he does, he invites people to come, come to the council. And I spent my Saturday nights going through the Shep Shed Albanac. But my friends were saying to me, you really need to get a life. And I'm like, no, it's, it's so fascinating. It's like a little soap opera. Because once you work out who the characters are, you counsel this owns the building firm. Oh, so that contract went to him. And counsel so-and-so owes this. And it was like, oh, my gosh. So he was saying to the people of Shepshed, you know, come and see the counselling operation. And there's one report in a minute saying the council chamber was full at the request of you know, Councillor Harley. What is he playing at? And it was an uproar. And it's very much a man of the people. We're here to serve you, not you serve us, you know, not for our benefits. We're not here to take what we can. He, he just seems like a, a genuinely caring person who who cares about everyone in his, in his, in his care, uh, within his constituent, within his church. Uh, and I think you also make a great point there that about people getting into history. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, we sit there and people think, why are you doing that? But when you actually break down the drama mm-hmm. and the soap, like you said, the soap opera within the history, people mm-hmm. get drawn into it. And I think that's one of the great things about, about this book is that you get all of those little soap dramas that could make several series of of a tv show and and dwarf the drama that we see in eastenders and so on because it is so fascinating it 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 really is because one of the things i found fascinating i had to keep putting myself back in the time of the context and kept thinking this is early 1900s and we talk about civil rights movement and you talk about it in the context of martin luther king rosa parks when you look back at what Harley was doing, and again, Josephine's parents, her mother, Rosetta Lawson, and your listeners might want to um, research Mary Church Terrell, a big campaign of suffrages and civil rights and anti-lynching. And again, they talk about black history. And that was 1900. And I just thought it was so fascinating. A, we don't know it. And B, it's not acknowledged. So that was happening back then. We kind of think civil rights, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks sat on the bus. And it's interesting with Mary Church Terrell. So in 1908, African-American woman, again, she was known as the grand dame of the Washington black elite. But at a very young age, she got on a bus, refused to give up her seat to a white man, and he went to hit her. And she raised her hand to her. Now, that is 1908. She could have been literally dragged off that bus and killed. And no one batted an eyelid. But you don't hear that. You hear about, no disrespect to Rosa Parks, but you hear from Rosa Parks. You don't think of back how long the community was fighting for civil rights, suffrage, anti-lynching. So that's why I found fascinating yeah. was oh my gosh, these people were really active. It, it just, just comes to show that history is bigger than those landmark moments. And there are more people than just those one individuals who are making that change. It's generations of people who are, who are fighting a fight to make sure that people can have you know, equality and, and be treated fairly and properly. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. I, I want to I switch back to Harley very mm. quickly. And by now, he's in his 60s mm. um, and he's, he's suffering from health issues. Mm. So w- what, what are these health issues and how are they affecting him? So he um, had heart problems. So he had a first heart attack. But Harley being high, he continues as a counsellor. He suffers a second heart attack. He takes some time off. I think it took, it took a year off. Then he comes back to the council. And by now, the Second World War has broken out and he becomes a welfare officer, a billeting officer. He's arranging evacuations and homes for children that have been evacuated. So his schedule and his workload is still as heavy and demanding as it always was. 
But again, that sense of purpose, that sense of duty. He's not a man to kind of sit down and think, well, I've done my bit, I've contributed. He's there. He's still enabling people. He's still contributing, literally to the very end. He's, he's just a, an inspiring individual in, in his tenacity to, to help other people and, and to do what he feels is the right thing. Mm. And I think, you know, across this, this very, very quick whistle-stop tour of Harley's life, mm. He has been shown to be an admirable person uh, and definitely mm. an inspiring individual. In terms of writing a book, because my, my publisher, I, I, this joke, my publisher, when I kind of found a story and I was telling him, and he said, no, I'm not publishing it. No. I said, why not? He said, no, it's going to be boring as fudge. He didn't actually say fudge. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, it's going to be, oh, look at this black man. He went to Harvard. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. So wonderful, so great. I said, trust me. It really isn't. And I think I portrayed him fairly, and I haven't painted a portrayal of a saint. You read the book, and so you know what I'm talking about. And there's flaws with his characteristics, which makes it interesting. So it's not a grandiose portrayal of saying, he's wonderful, he's great. He has his flaws, and it's complex. And you will read it and kind of, gasp at certain points and say i didn't see that coming i think i think that's a that's a great point to make actually because at points during this book whilst reading it i did actually think what a horrible man uh but then i was like oh wow he's he's so inspiring and he's an intelligent and thoughtful person and then and then again i go what why is he doing that uh and it's a very human stories like you said he's not a superhero he's he's not a saint but he's, he's it's very human and I, I did really enjoy that aspect of mm. the book mm. now i want i want to ask you a final fun question as we do for all our guests here on the history mm. of jackson podcast is you have worked in, in in many different roles and one of them has been in media production so what was your favorite project that you have worked on i'm going to be sneaky and say the favorite project is what i'm working on now and I'm writing a librato, and it's for a classical concert, and it's set to music with Harley. And so this is part of a wider project in terms of me profiling and making history accessible. So that's what I'm currently doing. I, I really like that project. I like, I like making history accessible, and, and when you can bring stories such as this to to a greater audience and make them be able not make them they're obviously there because they choose to be uh, yeah. but making the history accessible for them so they can understand i think is a great project so i think that's a fantastic answer now obviously people are going to want to find your book and you online so where can they find you and where can they grab a copy of your book so uh, you can find more about me on my website which is www Pamela Robert Author, all one word, dot com. You can go in there and it's available from Waterstones, Amazon, WH Smiths. Fantastic, because it is a great book and I really do implore people to go away and, and read it because you can learn so much um, about Harley's life and, and learn about some of the aspects that you've teased throughout this episode as well. So well, thank you very much for coming on, Pamela. Thank you so much, Jackson. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for listening to this latest episode of the History with Jackson podcast. Now, Pamela's book is fantastic and I do recommend you head to her website to go and grab a copy. And in the meantime, if you enjoy the content, if you did enjoy this episode, I would ask you to consider subscribing to History with Jackson Plus on Apple Podcasts or heading to my Buy Me A Coffee profile, which is in the description of this video, to help support me continue to do what I do. And I look forward to seeing you guys all next week where we have another amazing topic lined up to talk to you about.